If you are not going with the kids, that means you're staying here, and uh, you will need to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. So uh, the summer after my senior year of high school, I went to a Young Life camp where I served on their work crew. And I did this for a month. And there were about 50 of us there. And it was one of our very first nights. We'd been there a few nights. Um, and we'd had this consistent evening uh, worship time. And like the third night or so, one of our work crew bosses uh, began to share some thoughts about our futures. He told us, Statistically speaking, half of you will not have an active relationship with Jesus by the time you're 25. And as he's talking, it it's becomes sort of funny because there's sort of an audible snickering uh, among this group of us. Because we had just had this incredibly sort of intimate time of singing and praying. I mean, there were 50 of us packed into this smallish cabin, shoulder to shoulder. We felt probably closer to God than most of us had ever felt before. We felt closer to each other. We felt like we had everything we, we needed. And, and someone from our group actually said out loud, no way. We'd never let that happen. But our boss was insistent. He told us that, that our time serving on work crew could help us understand the challenges that were before us. Sure, we're excited now about a month of washing dishes, cleaning toilets, hauling trash, waiting tables, but we're three days in. What will happen after day 28? And he reminded us that these new friendships would grow old. Week three, there were some pretty major fights among us. He, he told us that, that following Jesus is hard. That committing our lives to constantly learning from Jesus is hard. And when it gets hard, many of you will quit, statistically speaking. We seriously thought our work crew boss was nuts. Uh, have you ever walked away from a message or a sermon and thought, what in the world is that guy talking about? Of course, that's never happened to you after a Sunday morning, but I mean other places and other parts of your life, right? Right, where you walk away, you're like, he just doesn't understand my life. He doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand my relationship with God. Why would he, why, this is one of the questions we were asking. Why would this guy spend a night talking about us walking away from God? This is the conversation that, that our work crew was having as we, as we left that sort of session that night. And the truth is, work crew eventually ended. We went home, and within a year, a few of us had sort of jumped ship, and another year or two went by, and there were a few more. And a few years ago, I, I came across, we were moving uh, an old roster from our work crew. And I don't know if it was exactly half, but I could go down the list and based on connections I'd had through Facebook or whatever, knew that there were a number of us that no longer had any interest in seeking God and serving God. Whatever various people had once felt toward God had faded. Sometimes when I read our passage from last week, I think of our work crew. Jesus has called together his 12 to warn them Jesus says something to the effect of, I'm going to send you out and it will be dangerous. And some of you, or some will reject your message and others will reject you and others will try to hurt you and some will try to falsely accuse you. Even your own family will hate you and try to kill you. And some who are with you right now will deny me. But don't, but don't fear. <laughs> because God is with you and you have great value to him. And, and I try to imagine the disciples hearing that. Up until now, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has what appears to be overwhelming success. Right? Crowds continue to surround him. People are drawn to his every word. They're hooked on his actions. Apart from the occasional snickering Pharisee here and there, some Gentiles uh, seemed to be afraid of him, but other than that, Jesus is sort of widely adored everywhere he goes, which then prompts Jesus to warn his disciples. 
One can easily imagine his disciples walking away, right, and scratching their heads wondering, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Jesus just doesn't understand. Maybe he's starting to feel the pressure of his, of his fame. Can't he see how swimmingly everything is? Sorry, I've been watching a lot of British TV recently. Swimmingly, it's a weird. But <laughs> chapters 11 and 12 of Matthew show us that Jesus understands exactly what he's saying to his disciples. The opposition that Jesus warns them about, he's beginning to face. But more than that, this opposition has already been taking place. They just haven't seen it. See, chapter 11 opens up by reintroducing a person that we haven't seen since chapter 4, when he was arrested. John the baptizer was, was put in prison, and there he has remained uh, until chapter 11, verse 2. And here from prison, John sends his disciples to Jesus because he has a question for them. And Jesus answers John's disciples and he sends them away, but then Jesus turns to the crowds and he talks to them about John. Essentially, Jesus asks them, what were you expecting when you went out to see John in the wilderness? Because from the days of John the baptizer until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. In other words, if the disciples face violent opposition, it's because John first faced violent opposition. John came preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. And then Jesus picks up that tune, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And as we learned last week then, the apostles have been instructed to preach the same thing, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so Matthew frames this story powerfully. John's preaching has resulted in violence, to, violence against the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were warned that their preaching will result in this same violence. And now we watch the middle of the story unfold as opposition to Jesus mounts. But in its earliest form, opposition isn't super active. It's what you might call passive, right? Chapter 11, verse 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum up until this point have seen Jesus heal and they've seen him cast out demons. And Matthew tells us that, in fact, they've seen these things more than just about anyone else. This is where the majority of his works have been done. These cities have been these hubs of, of Jesus' dynamic ministry. But Jesus has the exact same words for these people, the people in these cities, as John had for the Pharisees and the Sadducees that came out to see John as he was baptizing. Jesus makes sure that these people understand that watching the kingdom of heaven in action is not enough. The kingdom is not a spectator sport. In chapter 3, John called the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came out watching but refused to repent. He called them a brood of vipers. And he told them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Here in chapters 11 and 12, we hear Jesus using the exact same language. Jesus holds these cities accountable for refusing to be changed by the coming kingdom. They have been spectators of spectacle. They have been miracle junkies. These people are experiencing God in the most profound and intimate way that any human being had ever experienced God up until this point. If we think about some of the most amazing stories in all of scripture, Israel meeting God in the stories of the Exodus, the profound power of those events don't even match what happens when Jesus takes on flesh and comes and dwells among us and performs these signs. They have experienced God in the most profound way ever. God has come so near to them as to touch their flesh, to eat their meals, to share their conversations. But experience is insufficient to transform lives. They refuse to respond. Jesus then moves on from the cities 
to the religious leaders, and he calls for an inspection of their fruit. A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree, bad fruit. Which are they? Well, John had told them earlier, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You will know a tree by their fruit, by its fruit, Jesus says. And Jesus, like John before him, calls the Pharisees a brood of vipers because the Pharisees have begun to conspire against Jesus, exploring how they are going to kill him. They show themselves to be a violent people that are eager to take the kingdom of heaven by force. Passive rejection by crowds and cities, an active, antagonistic, and ultimately violent opposition by Pharisees and scribes. If the disciples experience rejection and, and uh, opposition in their lives and their ministries, it should not surprise them, right? This is what comes with a faithful proclamation of the kingdom of heaven. At least in 100% of its preachers thus far, John and then Jesus. But is it enough for Jesus to just warn them, right? When I teach Rebecca to how to ride her bike safely, I warn her about potential hazards. I instruct her on how to avoid them. I try to think of all of the possibilities, or if they're unavoidable, I try to tell her how to overcome them. But then I have to take her through situations. She actually has to try to ride and navigate some of these, these uh, obstacles so that hopefully, right, the, the ultimate goal would be that she would be capable of improvising when she faces something entirely new, something entirely unexpected, and she's all by herself. And along the way, as she falls, and she does fall, the hope is that I would be there to help her get up and to teach her to jump back on. And so in the same way Jesus does more than just warn, he doesn't merely tell his disciples in chapter 10, hey, watch out, bad stuff's gonna happen to you. But he trains them on how to follow. See, there's, go, there's, there's so much more going on in this passage than just opposition. There's something much more pervasive. In fact, it, it is the thing that seems to result in opposition, both passive opposition and active opposition. From the point when John reemerges at the beginning of chapter 11 to the closing of chapter 12, what we find in chapters 11 and 12 are questions. Lots of questions, questions from allies, questions from religious leaders, questions from the crowds, questions from Jesus himself. And in chapter 13, which is sort of an extension of these chapters, but we'll be looking at it next week, we get questions from the disciples, questions everywhere. And part of our task, right, as readers of the Gospel of Matthew is to make sense of all of this question asking, right? What are the questions that are being asked? Are they good questions? Are they bad questions? Uh, who, what are the answers being given? Who's giving them and what do they mean? And then how do the questions and answer, answers change things, uh, change dynamics, change relationships, change expectations? When we begin to take this look at the questions and the answers through these chapters, we can see that Matthew is presenting us with a pattern. Questions reveal expectations and answers reveal counter proposals right so it starts out in chapter 11 john the baptizer sends his disciples to jesus to ask a very important question are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another remember several chapters earlier before his arrest john was pretty sure this is the one who is to come now he seems to not be quite as certain. Because John's circumstances, being in prison, have fallen short of his expectations. It, do we know this experience where we assume that following Jesus may result in certain sort of life outcomes, and then we find ourselves in a place that fails to live up to those outcomes? Jesus answers John in a way that really can only mean, John, get used to your circumstances because this is the way it is for God's servants when they preach the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus doesn't offer him 
a fix to his circumstances. Essentially invites him to trust him in the midst of them. Jesus then turns to the crowds and asks them what they went out to the wilderness to see. A reed shaken by the wind, some sort of royal authority, a prophet perhaps. What were they expecting from John? Jesus wants to press them on that. Jesus then asks the town of Capernaum, and this is a town that he spent a significant amount of time in, if they think that they will be exalted to heaven. In other words, Jesus seems to be questioning their expectation that sort of mere attendance at the Jesus show is sufficient to grant them access to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus then asks some Pharisees, have you not read what David and those with him did when they were hungry? And then again, he asked them, have you not read in the law about the priests that work on the Sabbath? Of course they've read it. The Pharisees are experts in these texts. Almost immediately, the Pharisees return the favor and they have a question for Jesus. Well, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? In both of these instances, Jesus and the Pharisees are dealing with the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are working with an expectation. It was their belief that perfect or near perfect Sabbath observance would result in the Messiah's return, arrival and the restoration of Israel's kingdom. If they could keep the Sabbath, and of course there were some sort of peripheral issues, but if they could maintain it with perfection or near perfection, they could usher in God's kingdom. Of course, Jesus presents them with an entirely new possibility. Having already arrived as Messiah, could it be that the Messiah isn't brought in by perfect Sabbath observance, but that the Messiah brings with him perfect understanding of the Sabbath and perhaps restoration of it as a good gift for God's people. After Jesus then heals a demon-oppressed man who was both blind and mute, the people were amazed as we all should be, uh, and ask the question, can this be the son of David? There were specific expectations that these people were working with. There was the expectation that God's restoration of Israel's kingdom would be accompanied by certain kinds of signs, certain kinds of miracles, and this being one of them. But here, Jesus doesn't even get a chance to answer the questions from the crowds at least not immediately, because the Pharisees throw their cards on the table first. They know what's happening here. Whatever messianic or kingdom expectations uh, these religious leaders have, they do not involve Jesus at this point. Their answer to the crowd's question, is he the son of David, is to say, absolutely not. More likely, he is the prince of demons. Jesus quickly dismantles their answer and again provides a new possibility for them. He lays out a logical argument as to why he is not the prince of demons and suggests that then if he casts out demons by the spirit of God, then perhaps the kingdom of God has actually come among them. And he confronts them with their expectation that the kingdom might come certain things happen versus the kingdom has come. And so how now will you respond? Finally, in chapter 12, at the end of chapter 12, uh, it comes to a close with some questions by Jesus, questions about family. And so in a, in a family, uh, sorry, in a context, in a culture where family bonds are the absolute strongest and most important of all of your relationships and connections, Jesus asks this question uh, that's intended for his own family as well as for his disciples and the crowds. It's a question that he then answers himself, right? This is part of the examination reading through Matthew. Who asks the question and who answers it? Here it's Jesus and Jesus. And what he's doing is confronting expectations. Whatever it is you expect, let me offer, offer an alternative. In each and every one of these cases, there is a confrontation happening. P 
people expect God to be a certain way. They expect God to do certain things. They expect God's kingdom uh, to come in certain ways and to look certain ways. And when they are confronted with an alternative possibility, the question then becomes in every instance, what will they do when they're confronted with this alternative? Will they be offended by Jesus? Jesus poses that as a possibility to John. Will they, be, will they passively ignore Jesus' call to repent, like the cities that he names early on? Will they attempt to accuse or trap Jesus as the Pharisees do? Will they seek to destroy Jesus? When the kingdom of heaven is preached, all of these are possibilities. Whether you're Jesus or the disciples. So is the possibility that one will repent and follow Jesus. That too is a possibility. But it should be noted that as Matthew tells the story, this seems to be the rarer of possibilities. And so this then invites us, provokes us, challenges us, calls us to explore our own responsiveness to Jesus. It's worth exploring this with the categories that Matthew himself uses in these chapters. In chapter 11, after Jesus has been speaking against the cities that refuse to repent, he contrasts those who are wise and understanding to those who are little children. But the contrast is powerful, right? And it's the contrast that gets made throughout the rest of the New Testament. The way these categories, wise and understanding, work is not to describe people who know stuff, right, and are educated. These words, wise and, and understanding, are used to describe those who think that they have nothing left to learn. There, there's a difference there, right? Those who believe themselves wise, who think they understand, those who are generally resistant to being told that they might be wrong. The contrast, of course, being children. Children are constantly aware that they don't know things, right? They hear unfamiliar vocabulary all the time, and what do they do? They try it on, whether you want them to or not. Uh, they're, they're asking, what does that mean? They're filled with questions, what, where? How? When? Why? <laughs> That's our favorite. But, but when the Pharisees ask Jesus questions, when they come to Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They aren't looking to learn from Jesus. They already have an answer, and they expect Jesus to answer appropriately. They expect Jesus to submit to their categories, their expectations. But at several points, Jesus just pushes them, saying, I don't think you really understand what's happening here. Or even, if you had known what God meant, you wouldn't have done that. The Pharisees know who God is and what God is going to do. And when they are confronted by Jesus, rather than make room for Jesus and possibly learn something from Jesus, expanding their, their understanding of God, they remain rigid and they become violent against the one who would try to shake up their life and their definitions and their God. And so how responsive are we to Jesus? All right, what do we do when we come across the really hard stuff that Jesus says? You must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, offer them also the other. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. You cannot serve both God and money. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. Except the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. 
I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. This is just a tiny fraction of the things that Jesus says that we generally struggle with. And that then we generally do one of two things with. One of our responses is to, to be like the cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. We just passively ignore them while we just keep enjoying the Jesus show happening in our town. As long as Jesus keeps performing and we stay entertained, we'll hang around. But he can't demand too much of us. Or the other response is when confronted with Jesus' words, we respond like the Pharisees who, who rigidly reject the God who is revealing himself to them in Jesus. I was telling a friend of mine recently that it's, it's always funny when we talk about how difficult the Old Testament is because, oh, how quickly we forget how tough Jesus is. The truth is we just typically skip over the hard stuff. We come to the Gospels thinking we know who Jesus is. We come with a rigid, preformed idea about who Jesus is. And we come to the Gospels as those who are wise and understanding and think we have it all figured out. And so then when we're confronted with things that we find confusing or worse, things that could challenge some of our fundamental expectations for God and his kingdom, we respond defensively. We're, we're far too often like the Pharisees coming to Jesus with questions that we already have the answers for. How does Jesus fit into my, my questions, my categories? We already know who he is, or at least who we think he should be. And we know what he should be doing for us. And when Jesus isn't that, we tend to ignore him or attack him. The central characteristic of a disciple is a learner. Are we learners? Are you committed to unlearning some of the bad expectations that you have of God, that you have of Jesus, that you have of his kingdom? Are you committed to relearning the ways of the kingdom? Are you committed to inviting others or joining with others? who may be interested in this same learning along the way. Though he didn't use these specific categories, when my work crew boss, who I was telling you guys about at the beginning, uh, challenged us over 10 years ago now to persevere in faith, this is largely the issue that he was dealing with. He didn't use the, this exact language, but this is what I remembered for years him calling me to, him challenging me to. Would we stop learning about Jesus when Jesus became too hard? Would we become too, would we become antagonistic toward Jesus when Jesus became too offensive? Or would we devote our lives to learning from Jesus wherever he took us? Those who come to Jesus like children eager to learn, will have ears to hear.